So first off, thank you for joining. Um, this is uh, really for us an honor to be uh, asked to speak at the Responsive Conference. Um, I want to thank the Responsive team um, and Robin for bringing us here. Um, we're a bit biased, but we believe that remote is the future of work. Um, today, we're going to diverge from the theoretical sort of topics that are kind of being discussed in other um, rooms now and focus really on the tactics of transitioning from a HQ-centric company to being a remote-centric company. Um, why is that important? Everybody in this room is being asked for what their talent strategy is. Talent strategy is right after what's your funding strategy at this point in terms of building a company. And so for everyone here, you're going to be asked more and more frequently earlier in a company's uh, development, how are you going to uh, develop talent outside of your home market? Um, we say that this is 140 steps. In actuality, we have another presentation that has about 475 steps of actually going from being headquarter centric to remote centric. But here we're going to really focus on just some of the high level questions we should be asking before we go remote and then some of the tactical steps in terms of actually uh, implementing a strategy and creating a remote centric company. So a little on me uh, first. Uh, so I'm the chief executive officer for Terminal. Um, and I have spent a good portion of my career uh, being involved in early and fast growing uh, startups. Um, and it's given me an opportunity to uh, lead global expansion in a number of environments where I've opened up offices in a number of countries that you see here. Um, I'm a firm believer that the best companies are built out of necessity. And Terminal is an absolutely an example of where we were required to go remote to be successful. Terminal is actually a spin-off of a startup studio in San Francisco called Atomic. Atomic had the audacious goal of trying to build five companies at the same time and really struggled to be able to recruit engineering talent away from the companies like Google, Facebook, and the like. And so on a lark, in 2015, we decided to open up a, our first remote dev center in Waterloo, Ontario. And when we did that, we started with a five-person team and just wanted to test the waters on would that be, would we be more successful recruiting in that market, retaining talent in that market, and would we be differentiated versus what was already in the market? That team of five grew to a team of 40, and all five companies that we were incubating all went on for further financing. Every investor that came on board said, do more of this, and can you teach my other portfolio companies how to do this as well? So they were all seeing the early signs that this was a major problem and we had developed a solution that applied for not just one company, but could apply to many companies. Today, we are in uh, five markets, uh, four across uh, Canada, one in Mexico, Guadalajara. Um, we've built over 30 uh, remote teams, um, and we have over 200 engineers on those remote teams. So we have a couple key beliefs at Terminal um, that really kind of guide as we think about going remote. The first is that your talent strategy is your growth strategy. Every company is being limited today by, their by the talent that they have in-house and the need to expand that talent. The second is that what worked to get you here is not going to work in the future. So 10 years ago, when you were thinking about expanding and growing a company and growing a team, what those best practices no longer really apply in a world where you have to be more global and have to think more creatively. And lastly, the world is getting smaller, um, but we still need bridges. And this is really in a world where it's possible to raise a lot of capital, to invest that into building your own infrastructure. But going into multiple markets on your own, it's very difficult, very hard to do. And you really need to think about how do you build bridges into those markets. So why are we here? We're here because there is a massive imbalance between supply and demand of engineers in the United States. Code.org uh, code actually estimates that we'll have one million unfilled software development roles next year in the United States. Unfortunately, we're, not, we're paying the price for having a uh, slow to react educational policy in the United States, and we only are graduating uh, less than 60,000 computer science uh, graduates per year. 
So this imbalance is, is only getting worse. Um, and of course, as we know, uh, there's been zero increase in H-1B visa um, approvals over the course of the past 15 years. And if anything, immigration has only gotten more difficult in the last couple of years with the current administration. So why do we have this imbalance? The first thing is that, you know, people like to say it's, it's so easy to raise capital. And that's why all these jobs are being created. That's part of the equation. But really what we're finally seeing is that software has eaten the world. Every company now is hiring software developers because every company has software at the core of their value. The IP that they're creating is how they are generating value going forward. And that's why when we look across our markets where we're helping clients, the Bay Area, New York, Seattle, Boston, Austin, some of the largest employers of software developers are not Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple. Actually, they're banks. Their insurance companies, they're all hiring software developers as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, talent is global. And so if you look around the globe, um, by all estimates, we're seeing the fact that the investment in STEM is taking hold in other markets. And we're seeing much more engineers, much more engineering talent be developed outside the United States. By some estimates, 83% of software developer uh, talent lives outside the United States today. So when is the right time to explore remote? Um, we, we know we have this massive imbalance between supply and demand. We know we're being, uh, we're being limited in our growth by not, being, gaining, by not having the ability to access talent. So it is very common for companies to now start thinking about remote, but really need to think about from a timing perspective and a motivation perspective. Why are you looking to go remote? Is this because you're having difficult finding full-time engineering talent, product roadmap, slip, product roadmap slippage, or market entry as a strategic uh, um, priority? When do you wait to go remote? If you're doing this for a quick fix, there's an uh, immediate problem, just trying to get one more push, one more feature released. That's not a good reason to in make the investment to go remote. We believe that remote teams are basically becoming a, a strategic imperative for all companies as they think about growth. But before we go there, we have to talk about what is remote. Remote has become this blanket term that means everything from working from home to a fully distributed team across, uh, across the globe. And so when we think of remote, we think that the companies really start with one of two ways. They're either HQ centric, that's the vast majority of companies get started. Usually it's a group of guys and girls in a garage that come up with a great idea and that's how they start a company. Um, that is the beginning of an HQ centric company, right? Now there are some examples of some very successful distributed, distributed companies. Those that have really started in a distributed manner. And over the last couple of years, we've seen a couple of those that have been very successful. Our argument would be, that you typically can't go from one of these extremes to the other fully. It's a really hard thing to do. Not most companies, can, most companies can't pull it off. And frankly, most companies to be distributed, they have to start that way and they have to have a product that enables their ability to, to remain distributed. And there's very few that can actually pull that off. So when we talk about remote, what we're talking about is how do you transition from HQ centric to move down the chain to becoming a hybrid company. So you start by becoming remote friendly, you move to having multi-sites, and then ultimately you become a hybrid. Today's topics are gonna to be about kind of that transition. So going remote, it cannot be a knee-jerk sort of decision. Um, it needs to be something that you are prioritized across your leadership team there's buy-in from everyone, and that there's actual uh, dedication to the time, the resources, and the bandwidth required to go remote. And the reason we use this slide to kind of talk about this is that all these faces here are, are engineers, remote engineers at terminal campuses today. Every one of them is making a decision about their career, making a very important decision in their life to join, a be a remote employee, for a company on one of our campuses. They require your commitment. 
right? If you're going to get in front of them and try to recruit them to join your cause, you better be committed to actually providing a great environment for them, a great learning environment for them, a great professional development opportunity for them. And when you make the wrong decisions, it can have long-term implications. Just two kind of high-profile examples here, IBM and Yahoo both kind of moving away from really kind of a work-at-home policy um, for what they called their remote employees. And in both cases, really got a lot of negative publicity, uh, ended up not even actually implementing what they, the changes that they were trying to implement, and ultimately really was a black eye on kind of what they were trying to accomplish and the company. So today we'll talk about the 140 steps of going remote. Fortunately, they've been broken down into seven digestible uh, little tips that we have. We're gonna run through these, but I want you all to feel very comfortable asking questions, stopping, asking for clarity, anything that can be helpful, uh, especially given that we have a relatively small group, we can talk at, in, in more detail. So the first step is determining which market um, you want to think about for uh, building a remote team. And when you think about the, the different factors that come into play there, there's a lot of different elements that come into play. There's how much uh, talent is in that market. There's the cost of building in that market. There's the convenience factor. So we'll run through quite a bit of different data points that you should be collecting before you make this decision. Um, but you have to be data driven. We're at a point in time where a lot of remote decisions used to be made by gut. They used to be made based on if we know someone who's there, let's build a team around that person. We're at a point in time, we're at a time and place where there is, these are long term decisions we're making. They really should be data driven decisions. You have to look at the total cost of moving into a market, the total benefits of moving into the market and be able to kind of weigh those against each other. You have to spend time going to the markets and actually understanding the dynamics in the market. Every, all of us can read a report, all of us can collect data online, but when you actually go and see in person, you'll get a sense for how active is the dev community? How excited are people in this market for my type of company or the type of work that we want to uh, bring into market? It does take time to build relationships. When you're entering a market from scratch, there are people who are good ambassadors for you. There are people who are going to make it easier for you to enter that market and build an employer brand. Finding those people, starting to build relationships with them, whether they're community leaders, whether they are involved with the educational, um, uh, educational institutions in that market, um, all these things actually ease your, pro your, uh, your process of entering the market um, and fundamentally make it so you have a stronger employer brand. And then finally, you have to be realistic about speed. Again, this is not a knee-jerk reaction. You can't just wake up one day and become a remote company. You have to go through the process of actually doing the analysis and preparing uh, across the leadership team, preparing across the company to become a remote team, remote company. So we typically look at about 50 to 70 different data points um, before we decide to go into a market. Um, some of these are very easy to gather. Some take a little bit of uh, sleuth and acquiring of data um, to be able to pull this together. But all of these kind of come back to a couple of themes in terms of the data that you want to collect. The first is how large is the talent pool? Is this going to be a market that can support your growth for the next 10 years? What's feeding that talent pool? Is it good universities? Is it other companies that are good at training? What are those things that are gonna make it so that you can be, it can be a sustainable market for you for the long haul? Costs. Of course, every, every decision we make, it has some uh, element of cost associated with it. So what are the average salaries? What are the costs of building a new business? What are the, what's rent? All the costs that are gonna come into building a remote office. Government support. In many different markets, Government will play a role in trying to incentivize for job creation. Um, do they play, will they play an active role in the market in which you uh, want to operate? Are they going to have a more friendly immigration policy for uh, out of market uh, talent? Do they provide any sort of grants uh, for research? Convenience. 
what languages are spoken, how long will it take you to be able to travel back and forth to the remote office, how, uh, how consistent are you in terms of time zone alignment. These are all things that you need to take into consideration. And finally, developer community. How active is the developer community? How are people going to be uh, doing their own sort of professional development outside of what you provide as a company? So a couple examples here uh, that we've gone through in terms of analyses for uh, clients that we've worked with. Uh, one scenario here is, or I should say before, each company has their own analysis. There is no one size fits all uh, for a remote decision. So when you look at each scenario here, you're going to see that there's different factors that are important to each of these uh, clients. In this case, Eventbrite was looking to build a large team quickly. They're cost conscious. Uh, they did not want to uh, spend quite a bit uh, to build this team. They're planning on providing their own training, so they're okay going with a, a younger or more junior engineering team. Um, and so when you do that analysis, you come out with these markets, Lisbon, Monterey, Guadalajara, as being great markets for them to think about building their remote team. Another scenario is a growth stage company, HIMS. Uh, which needs more seasoned talent. Um, they were cost conscious. Uh, they are le less cost conscious. They didn't really care. Uh, they just needed access to talent immediately and more mid-level to senior level talent uh, to be able to hit their goals. And with that said, they were less interested in providing heavy training. They need people who could be up and running immediately. So in that case, Toronto, Kitchener-Waterloo, Melbourne were really good markets for them. And lastly, Bluescape was a company that was looking for sustainable scale over immediacy. Balanced, they were not worried about cost, but they also didn't want to spend a tremendous amount. Um, and they were looking at having a balanced org between kind of senior and junior level. And so for them, Monterey, Guadalajara, Bogota looked to be great uh, markets for them. So again, the takeaway here is that these companies all have different goals in mind when they went to when they started their conversion to being remote centric. That really weighed into their decision process. The next step is creating your entity. Once you've decided on a market, going through the process of actually creating the entity. These are where you're gonna need your lawyers, you're gonna need your accountants, you're gonna need a lot of help. Uh, finding local representation is very important. Finding somebody uh, who has done this before in that market is very important. So you want to spend a lot of time here building the right relationships. Finding office space. When you move into a market, it's often difficult to understand what actually is a good, uh, what is a good office space, what does a commercial real estate market look like. You're going to probably go through at least one broker, if not multiple. Um, but you have to get a lay of the land, understand how competitive the market is. Toronto, for instance, for us, is a booming market, but it's also booming for everyone. Has less than 3% uh, 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 vacancy rate for commercial real estate right now. So usually when you're looking to put in an offer for uh, commercial real estate in Toronto, before it even hits the market, there's 10 offers. And the answers are coming extremely quickly because it's very much a uh, landlord's market. Um, Design the space. We all know that space plays a critical role in building the right culture, building the right sense of community for our teams. So going through the process of finding the right kind of architect and design firm, ensuring that they're going to be able to really kind of encapsulate what makes you unique, what makes your company unique, and bring that into this new environment, but also balance that with the local culture. You, want it, you don't want this to be sort of you know, San Francisco or New York culture forced down everyone's throat, you want this to feel organic, but really stay within your corporate culture as well. So going through the process of creating that vision, getting buy-off internally, hiring the engineering firm, submitting permits, beginning construction, interior design, all these are steps that you need to build into your plan. Building the recruiting function. This is what many people take for granted and think it's very easy. We've got great recruiters in our market. We can just use them, apply them into a new market. It's very hard to do that. The recruiters did typically need to have a network, have to understand 
the landscape. You want to decide early on whether you're going to use a third party or you're going to bring or you're going to use in-house. You need to integrate them into your recruiting process. When you are starting to build a remote team, you need to make sure that you're building a remote-friendly recruiting process. That means adjusting your existing sort of process from if you have people, if you have multiple sort of uh, multiple sort of steps in your process, make sure you try to really condense those as much as possible. Make it as asynchronous as possible, right? So that they don't have to be taking all this time off of out of their schedule to be doing video interviews uh, with different people at different times. You need to determine what your market entry messaging is going to be. Why did you choose this market? Why are you excited about them? How can they help you really uh, fulfill kind of what your goals are? You need to invest in employer brand building. These are basic things, but go to the events, create partnerships with the dev community, create partnerships with the universities, do things that are gonna raise your profile so that people are thinking about you, whether they're looking for a job or not. And then you need to leverage top local job posting platforms. Every market has unique uh, job posting platforms. Not everyone is 100% reliant on Indeed or LinkedIn. Find those local ones that are different and make sure you invest in building a relationship with those folks. When you're interviewing for remote employees, you really need to focus on over-indexing on certain characteristics. Key attributes that you want to look for, are they good communicators? They're gonna be online, they're gonna be on video with you often. Can they communicate what they're working on, the challenges they're having? Can they communicate over email uh, effectively? Are they self-sustainable? Are they go-getters? Can they, can they deliver on projects when no one around them is working on the same project, right? Make sure that they have, they have examples of where they've gone above and beyond to take on sort of the initiative, whether they're, they're working in a headquarter-centric company now or, um, or even as a student. Can they collaborate? Are they gonna be a good teammate? Are people going to want to work with them? Are people going to give them the benefit of the doubt? Do they have previous remote experience? That's a real good judge for can they be successful in this environment? Do they understand sort of the, some of the challenges? And then are they good with time management? Building the HR function. Definitely part of the process is figuring out how you're going to pay your employees. How are you going to have the right level of insurance, right brokerage for uh, making sure that the benefits are established. You have to register and train your employees on how to leverage the, the, the new systems that you're using, the new partners that you have in place. Setting up billing, register with the regulatory bodies. All these are the, the kind of the nuts and bolts that you have to go through when you are building a remote team. Finally, how do you retain that team? You need to build a welcoming environment. You have to maintain strong communication structure across your org. Both headquarter and the remote teams need to adhere to that communication structure. You want to mirror your office culture, your home office culture, but you don't want to force it into the new market. You want to really make your onboarding and training a program. Make, understand that for your remote employees, it needs to be a different program, but it needs to be as, you need to invest as much time as you would for any HQ employee. You need to make sure you have monthly check-ins, make sure that's part of your normal process, um, and you have to be very flexible. You're gonna find that there's challenges when you're building a remote team that you didn't expect. Maybe you need to change some of your communication policies Maybe you need to increase certain ways that you do, um, you, you communicate. These things you have to be able to review and, and adapt accordingly. So we have a couple best practices to run through here um, that we've seen kind of across building our, helping our clients build their teams um, that really kind of run the gamut. So when you onboard new hires, um, make sure it happens quickly. Make sure that they come on board, that they are part of the team immediately. It's not this, hey, we have a new team or a new resource over here. They're going to come and join us at some point in the future. Make them part of the team day one, right? 
make sure the team understands you have new team members. They have to be included in the activities. You're gonna wanna, at some point, build autonomy into your remote team. So when you're thinking about the structure of your team, think about having leaders in that market, people who you're going to trust to make the decisions for that group and ultimately for the company. Obviously, communicate, communicate, communicate. You have to over-communicate. Use all the, all the tools that are out there, but make sure you're communicating with your team so that they understand. That's the number one issue with remote teams is that there's a breakdown in communication, and when people don't get the message, they don't get, they don't, they're, they're not um, part of that communication flow, they tend to start thinking the worst. Right? They, st they tend to start asking questions, thinking that they're not valued, so you just have to over-communicate. You really should encourage travel between HQ and the remote office. And that's in both ways. Yeah, I, that's bringing people, into, bringing people from the remote office to HQ, but it's also showing from a leadership perspective that you care about the remote team and you're gonna take time, the leadership team's gonna take time to visit that group. Keeping proper structured documentation so that people have the ability to answer questions on their own. Be able to go onto your intranet, go into uh, any sort of tools that you have and find answers without having to feel like they're lost, without having to ask somebody else um, who they're not comfortable with is a huge, huge uh, point. And then finally, provide access to leadership. A lot of people we talk to say, oh, we're remote friendly. We have um, office hours every week. That's not enough. Leadership team has to go out of their way to make sure that they're available and making it very easy for remote employees who may or may not feel comfortable reaching out or scheduling time with the leadership team. When you think about the org structure, you have to think about what your goals are from day one. Is this about augmentation to the team or supplementation of the team? Are you building a team to plug into the existing gaps that you currently have? Or are you building an independent team that's going to be in the remote office? And so how do you then structure how things are, how the team is, is structured, and then also how, how leadership is structured around those teams? Finding, as I mentioned, finding that local leader, that person who's going to be that kind of magnet for talent in the market is really important. Those people tend to have a great network with them, but they tend to create the right culture, right? And that's really important when you're getting started. In the end, you want this team to ultimately be standalone, be able to own end-to-end -end product, make decisions on the product, um, and as they get to kind of a six-plus team size, um, truly have the ability to go from design to testing and all be owned in one location. We talked about culture. Again, it's really important uh, from a culture perspective that you create a welcoming culture, that you allow for what makes you unique, what makes your company special from a corporate culture perspective, but you translate that into the market in which you're going into. Again, nobody wants to be told, this is the San Francisco way of doing things. Right? They want to understand, hey, this is our way, this is our company's way, but here's how we've adjusted our culture, here's how the, the culture has uh, been modified for Van the Vancouver culture, the Toronto culture. And again, building that encouraging travel between the offices, developing strong and personal relationships, off-sites, annual uh, summits, meetings where everyone comes together is really important. Communication, again, focusing on communication from day one is probably the most important thing that you can do. Invest in the right tools, invest in the right infrastructure, make it part of how everyone does their work. A big transition for companies that become remote-centric is moving from a world where you have a meeting happening in one room and one person on the screen uh, from somewhere else you're seeing now more and more companies are doing everybody's on the screen, 
regardless of everyone's in, you know, as long as there's one person who's not in the room, everyone then opens up their computer and has their screen. And that's one way of just making it feel like we're all in this together. There's nothing happening in this room that that person's not getting exposure to. You want to really define upfront how work is done within the company so that they don't have to think it through, they don't have to start to uh, explore on their own, try and figure out things on their own. Really just make it very clear how work is done and what the goals are. Again, communicating frequently over multiple channels. Um, obviously, Slack's a great tool, uh, Zoom's a great tool, but making sure that you know, it's followed up with an email. If it's really important, make sure that it's a, you're just kind of beating the drum over and over. Try to break down the barriers of uh, distance. So there are great tools um, that you can leverage. That one's called Donut that uh, is over Slack that allows for you to have kind of virtual coffees with people on a random basis. There's a lot of different tools out there that will help you kind of break down those barriers and just make it part of your company culture. Don't make it an off you know, offshoot thing. Just make it part of the culture and everyone will do it. And of course, you have to understand the local markets from a sort of uh, hours and holidays perspective and make that kind of uh, known and aware uh, throughout the company. In terms of best practices from a tech perspective, here's a couple of, of solutions that are out there. Um, we've seen a lot of different ones being used. Um, you know, we use a number of these ourselves, but really, you know, the idea is consistency in the, in the tools that you, that you choose and making sure it's adopted across the company. Don't have the remote team solution, right? They're on one kind of uh, system for communication and everyone else is on something else. Make sure that everyone is leveraging the same tools and that will make it so that everyone is on a fair playing ground and everyone will feel like they're getting the same sort of level of attention and communication uh, as necessary. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Hopefully this was helpful. <laughs> yep. Um, when I saw the title and it was remote, I thought, like, work from home. And then you said that you got, got rid of it. So I was like, OK, it's not work from home. And I thought, well, maybe you just have people working from home in locations, and you have the office piece. So I, I think I'm kind of curious how you define that, like, the remote. Is it just you have another location that doesn't have as many as your headquarters, and that's your definition of remote? And what point does it just not become yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that remote as a term, as we talked about, has kind of become this blanket term. And I think it's, it, right now, it kind of means anything outside of HQ, right? But I think that what we're trying to get to is really, truly define types of remote, right? Because I think it's very different to just have a work from home policy versus actually investing in actually going into a new market and building a presence in that market. What we call, at Terminal, we call them remote teams, right? So our belief is that when you go to that kind of hybrid model, you're going to start to see that by being open to different markets, you're going to get access to better talent. But there's still a need for people to come together, maybe not all the time, but very frequently to be able to kind of innovate together, do that sort of um, collaboration that's required. And so you're going to see a world where you're going to have a lot of different small teams throughout the world. And there might be offshoots from those teams, right? There might be a distributed employee or two, but you're gonna most likely have these centers of excellence where you have small teams built together. And so that's kind of our vision, or our you know, kind of take is that we're gonna see a lot of companies kind of go down that evolution as opposed to going fully distributed, right? Which becomes, again, is very difficult for a company to transition to um, and is really dependent on the kind of product that you're building. Similar. I, so we call these campuses when we go to different markets. We have multiple campuses from the United States. But well, my question, I would love any, we have not done remote work. We have teams and they feel collaborative in their teams in the different areas. Uh, and we are now piloting one person probably working from home and others. If this works out, like we want that opportunity too. I want to be in Brazil. I want to be in Connecticut. Great. Yeah, so, you know, I think that it's, 
there are some, some differences when they're completely distributed. Um, but I think a lot of the same sort of uh, kind of best practices are consistent. And I think it's, it really does come down to communication, right? Um, there's a number of tools that are out there that will help you um, kind of try and make a distributed workforce feel a little bit closer. There's some that are even, you know, trying to create like virtual you know, offices where you can see where that employee is in the virtual office, if you will. Um, but the, you know, I think what we have seen across our clients that have a kind of hybrid model and has been uh, you know, successful for them is when you do have distributed a workforce, really ensuring that you are bringing everyone together at least once or twice a year to kind of make sure that the, the culture, the kind of mission and vision are, are continuing to kind of be present in front of mind. Establishing some of those personal relationships in person so that when you're away, you, you can leverage those. Um, really being thoughtful about kind of the policies that you have in place that apply across you know, uh, regions. Um, I know that there's been you know, examples of where companies have gone distributed, but there's been some challenges because the benefits provided to some employees are better in some markets than others. So being thoughtful about how you've actually structured all of your sort of uh, compensation and benefits policies. Um, but in general, I think that you know, what it comes down to when you're fully distributed is you have to have a high level of trust, right? So your hiring bar needs to be extremely high in terms, of, uh, in terms of trust. And you have to make sure that you have checks and balances in place so that if, there is, if, if there's something that doesn't seem right, you have quick action to actually do something about that. Um, and that's where I think a lot of companies struggle because it's, it is difficult to truly know what's happening in a distributed environment. And so if you have a breakdown of trust, then things can get um, pretty dicey. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>